All right, let's do it now. Get this thing fired up here. Maybe I can answer the first question without having the laptop all the way up. So, who wants to start? Yes. What is the significance of absolute zero? What is the significance of absolute zero? It's what, so, what happens when things get hotter? Gets to that. What happens when things get hotter? In other words, if I have a cold room and a hot room, what's the difference between the motion of the molecules in the air in the cold room versus the hot room? Slower. Slower. Yeah, in the hot room, the molecules are moving faster, right? So the colder it gets, the slower the molecules are moving. Absolute zero is when they can't move any slower. Classically, we would have thought that meant all molecular motion ceases. Quantum mechanics says that's impossible. So absolute zero is the coldest possible temperature where there's a minimum possible amount of molecular motion, essentially. So uh, that's really what it comes down to is it's the coldest possible temperature. You can't get colder than absolute zero Kelvin. Can't be done. <laughs> I'd say that's pretty significant. Let's see. Who wants to ask the next question or want to be? So if, if, if I answer a question and like, huh, still don't get it, just say, oh, I want to know. I want to actually understand. So, so I'll get you in a second, but there's a hand over here somewhere. Yes, OK. I just wanted you to stop by the lower on the table. Oh, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Here, let's just put it right here. Yes. OK. No, it's my, it's my precious chalk holder. So I, I, I am grateful that you don't want my precious chalk holder to uh, to, to hurt it, be hurt my baby. Yeah, I worry about it anymore. Yeah, yeah, me too. Okay. Uh, questions? Um, you know the topic just for a minute. Sure. Uh, let me get this thing all over here. And then, because of the way this room is set up, where we've got a uh, screen in the middle, I guess I'll just come over here. Here and hope everybody can see it and turn on some lights here. Oh, lighting. Oh, there was a problem. I don't care about that problem. Computer. Okay. So Doppler shift formula says that the change in the wavelength divided by the wavelength is the radial velocity divided by C, if we're talking about light. C is the wave speed. So it's the speed of sound if we're talking about sound waves. It's the speed of light if we're talking about light waves. The radial, the radial velocity is the component of the velocity along the line of sight So to speak, 
Shorter if it's moving towards you. If it's moving towards you, that's when the wavelengths pile up in front of it and become shorter as a result of that. And this is what you use if you want quantitative results. Like in other words, if I if I know what uh, the shift in the wavelength is and I want to define the radial velocity, I would solve this for the radial velocity. So now if, another way to rearrange it is the radial velocity is equal to uh, the speed of light times the change in the wavelength divided by the wavelength. This would be the two ways you're most likely to be asked to use the formula. So you're, you're told what the change in the wavelength is. How fast is it moving towards or away from you? We plug into this formula, for example. Uh, so. Does that, uh, does that do it for you, or would you like me to say more about that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? Um, actually, can you just talk a little bit more about the radial velocity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So what is the radial velocity? So um, let me, there's the magic uh, screen razor. Here it is. So you might think, 
Well, no, it's getting further away at this moment. But it isn't not right at that moment because before it reaches that point, it was getting closer. After it passes that point, it's getting further away. So at that point itself, it's neither getting closer nor getting further away. At that very moment, it's a calculus thing, really. At that very moment, it's neither getting closer nor getting further away. And for that reason, there's no Doppler shift at the instant when something is moving perpendicular to the line of sight. Before that, there is a blue shift because it's getting closer. After that, there's a red shift because it's getting further. But right at that moment, at that instant in time when it's moving perpendicular to the line of sight, there's no Doppler shift one way or the other. So that's how that works, basically. So be sure you realize that. Yes? So if it's getting closer, you've got a redshift. If it's a, 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 a sorry. If it's getting farther, you've got a redshift. If it's getting closer, you get a blue shift. So. But well, if it goes in either up by the same amount or down by the same amount, how do you? Okay. So first of all, so ignore this one for a minute. This one right here is the distance increasing or decreasing? It's decreasing, right? If I had a string here and I wanted to. Uh, or if I had a rubber band here, let's say, and I move my finger with the rubber band attached to it along this direction, the length of the rubber band is getting shorter as I go. So that's going to be a redshift in that situation. Okay? Now go here. Suppose that I'm at this location right here. Suppose I've got some particle that's moving along this line right here. Okay? Right now, is the rubber band getting longer or shorter as I move along? It's getting shorter, so the distance is decreasing. So there's a, uh, a blue shift at this point, OK? Blue shift, blue shift, blue shift, blue shift, blue shift. The blue shift is getting smaller and smaller, though. The amount of blue shift would be getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. How about over here? Is the rubber band increasing or decreasing in length? It's increasing in length. It's stretching, right? So redshift over here. So it's it's you know I'll use the the loudness of my voice to kind of indicate how much blue shift, how much the redshift. Okay, so blue shift, blue shift, blue shift, shift, red shift, red shift, red shift. That's kind of the idea there. Is you go from blue shift, less and less blue shift, blah blah blah, blah. no blue shift at all, no red shift at all, a little bit of red shift, no more red shift, more red shift, more red shift. That's the idea there. Yes? Um, sorry, I can't hear you. Oh. Um, uh, can you talk about um, extended objects? I, I certainly can, as long as I'm sure everybody's happy with this part now. So does anybody retain unhappiness about this Doppler shift stuff here? So the punchline is, if the distance is decreasing, there's a blue shift. If the distance is increasing, there's a red shift. The faster the distance is increasing or decreasing, the more is the redshift or blue shift. If you're moving perpendicular to the line of sight, there's no Doppler shift at all. You see the unshifted way. That's the way all of that works. Okay, anybody <coughs> want to ask a follow-up on that? Yes? So the line of sight keeps changing, by the way. Okay, so the, the line of sight is what it's really the instantaneous line of sight. So in other words, so be quiet, Tony. Thank you for that, but La la. <laughs> oh, I know what it's from. No, that's a different thing. It's it's singing happily because the battery is fully charged. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Focus. All right. Yeah, that's a different. Okay. Is it focused? All right. <laughs> so let's try that again. Yes. So the line of sight keeps 
doesn't. In other words, when the particle is right here, the line of sight at that instant is that. The line of sight is always at any given moment the line from your eye or observation station to where it is at that moment. So the line of sight keeps changing, basically. Sorry. Oh, you're just, oh, okay, okay. All right, fine. So I guess I answered your question, and now you're done. No, you're not. I still have to go. That's okay. All right, well, the video will be up later, so, yeah. This sucks. I'm out of here. Okay. You know it. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Alright, so. Uh, question, though, which I've totally forgotten, so how about if you re ask it? Um, oh, extended objects, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Like how is an how is an image formed of an extended object, basically? Extended object just means something that isn't only in so like if you look at a star, it looks like a little pinpoint. I mean, a real star is gigantic and all that. But in other words, extended object just means something that's in, whose image isn't just going to be a little pinpoint on the screen or the or the, the imaging chip or the film or whatever. So uh, let me bring up the relevant. Okay. I just want to know if um, you need to understand the properties of concave and convex like lenses. 
uh, in general terms, I mean, I want you to understand the idea that um, the curved surface of the mirror or the curved surface of the lens have the property that they allow light rays to be brought together to a focus, is what it comes down to. And then understand the idea of what focal length is and focal plane and, and so forth. So the focal length is where images from infinitely far away objects would form, uh, how far behind the lens they would. Star, so, but infinitely far away really means just very far away compared to the focal length of the lens. So, stuff at the back of the room is effectively very, very far away as far as your eyes concerned, because the lens of your eye has a focal length about the length of your eyeball, for example. So, and if it doesn't, that's why you wear glasses. I wear glasses because the focal length of the lenses in my eyes is shorter than the length of my eyeballs. And so as a result, I need corrective lenses to allow sharp images to be formed on my lenses. I'm certainly not alone in Advantage of living in an era where that doesn't get you eaten by a tiger. <laughs> so, <laughs> before modern technology, right, I'd be like walking along, the tiger would be on me, and I wouldn't even know it hit me, because I wouldn't be able to see it. So, yay, technology. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about the Balmer series? Balmer series, sure. So, what do you want to know about the Balmer series? Just Balmer series in general? Well, I don't really understand. Like, I understand that it's visible light, but I don't understand what I'm seeing. Okay. Um, so, remember that every element has its own spectrum. It's its own set of spectral lines that it quote unquote likes to emit. Well, for hydrogen, let me see it like this. For hydrogen, um, it has a distinctive red spectral line that it emits if you heat it hot enough to glow, and a lovely kind of turquoise spectral line, and uh, a blue and a violet spectral line. And these guys up here are actually in the ultraviolet. They're kind of cheating here. Your eye wouldn't actually see those wavelengths. So there are four wavelengths that hydrogen emits that your retina is able to pick up. And they've got those four different colors, red, turquoise, blue, and <coughs> indigo uh, kind of color. And those, th those lines that you're seeing in that representation, those are Volmer series spectral lines. So uh, let me pull up the energy level diagram for hydrogen this guy right here, and so, I need a pointer, oh, this is I don't know, I'm not seeing it. Okay, um, so the hydrogen, the, the hydrogen energy levels, uh, we label them with an uh, integer that we just call n, n equals one, is the ground state, the lowest possible energy of the electron you have. N equals two is the next one up. N equals three is the next one up from that. N equals four and so forth. The different series of spectral lines uh, begin or end on one particular level for the electron. So the Lyman series in hydrogen is all the transitions where the electron either starts or ends in the ground state. And the Balmer series is all the transitions where the electron either starts or ends on n equals 2, and the other levels involved have to be higher. In other words, there's the, the, the linking between 2 and 1 is considered in the Lyman series, not the Balmer series. So, so all the transitions between n equals 2 and anything to or from anything higher is a Balmer series spectral line. It's just the name we give them. Uh, they're named after uh, a high school teacher, basically, from back in the 1800s, who got his name attached to them. And I think, yeah, I think it was Palmer. Yeah, I think it was Palmer. I think that, yeah. Anyway, Hashin series, n equals 3 is where they start before again, going up to higher or lower levels. So look at the Lyman series 
easier. If the electron starts in the ground state and ends up in n equals 2, has it gained energy or lost energy? It has gained energy. So did it emit a photon or absorb a photon? It absorbed a photon. So if it absorbs a photon in the ground state and jumps up to n equals 2, that is the lowest possible energy Lyman series spectral line. It would show up as a dark line. It would be, a, it would be an absorption line if it's absorption that we're talking about. What would its energy be if the ground state is 0 electron volts and the n equals 2 levels 10.2 electron volts? What's the energy of this photon? 10.2 electron volts because you just take the difference between the two energy levels. Now, 10.2 electron volts. Uh, remember when we said for visible light, what kind of ranges are we talking? Typical visible light photons have energies of around how many electron volts? It's a little high. About 2 to 3, roughly speaking. About 2 to 3 it works out. So this is 10.2 electron volts. That's more energy than visible light photons have. So. Uh, is that going to be infrared or ultraviolet, given that it's a bit more energetic than visible light? Yeah, ultraviolet, because shorter wavelengths are going to be higher energies, and so that's an ultraviolet line. If I go from n equals 1 to n equals 3, that's even more energy. So that's also going to be not visible. If this one's not visible, neither is this one, neither is this one, neither is this one. The Lyman series lines are all in the ultraviolet every single one of them. The Baller series lines, on the other hand, suppose I go from n equals 2 to n equals 3. So I'm going from 10.2 electron volts to 12.1 to electron volts. How many electron volts is it to go from 2 to 3? 10.1, uh, 12.1 minus 10.2 is 1.9 electron volts. You think that's visible? It is, it is, because the, the range of visible is not literally 2 to 3. It's 2-ish it's two to 3-ish, to to really. So 1.9 electron volts turns out to be a visible wavelength of light. Uh, if I go from n equals 2 to n equals 4, I'm going from 10.2 to 12.8. How many electron volts is that transition? 2.6, because it's 12.8 minus 10.2, so that's going to be 2.6 electron volts. Will that be visible? Yep. Which one will have the shorter wavelength? The 1.9 electron volt transition or the 2.6 electron volt transition? 2.6 will be a shorter wavelength. Okay? And in fact, if we go back to the earlier picture, guy right here, the n equals 2 to n equals 3 transition, okay, I'm just going to do it, <laughs> the n equals 2 to n equals 3 transition is this red spectral line right there. This red spectral line is created in emission when electrons are jumping down from n equals 3 to n equals 2. And the 4 to 2 transition is this lovely cyan spectral line with an energy of 2.6 electron volts per photon. And five to, uh, 5 to 2 is this blue spectral line, and 6 to 2 is this purple spectral line, and 7 to 2 and 8 to 2 and 9 to 2 and so forth are these ultraviolet spectral lines. So it just it works out that uh, uh, three, four, it? The, 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 the ones past 6 to 2 are a little bit in the ultraviolet. They're a little bit too short in wavelength for eyes to see. So the Balmer series lines are the ones that we can actually see with our eye when we are looking at hydrogen. And in terms of spectral, in terms of stars spectra, the significance is, well, with stars, do we see an emission line spectrum or an absorption line spectrum? <laughs> if you say emission and I just sit there like this, Probably you should change your mind, right? Uh, so, uh, stars have absorption line spectra because they give off a rainbow of colors crisscrossed with dark lines. Because remember that atoms in these stars' outer layers, the cooler outer layers of the star, 
are absorbing photons coming up from lower levels, removing them from the star spectrum, and thereby producing an absorption spectrum. And so here are uh, various stars, uh, various star spectra, and in fact, um, there are hydrogen lines in here. So the you gotta find it here. I believe it's uh, yeah. This guy no, that's not it. Six fifty. So yeah, this guy. This is the absorption line for that red line that you saw before in emission. So this is. This is the n equals 2 to n equals 3 transition in hydrogen in absorption in star spectra. So hydrogen atoms in the star's outer layers are absorbing photons of just the right wavelength to make them jump from n equals 2 to n equals 3, and producing that dark line right there. And the other one is there, too. the other four, or the other three Balmer series spectral lines are in there, too. And so the significance of them is they're, they're the, the lines in hydrogen spectrum that we can actually see. Yes. Um, so then, I, I might have missed it. Can you explain why um, some elements have different Like why different elements have different spectral lines, yeah. you mean? Yeah, so, uh, right. So if we go back to that yeah. earlier image, then back in the other PowerPoint. So every, every element has a different set of spectral lines, right? Why is that? Why does every element have different spectral lines from every other element? Why would that be? Different energy levels is the key there. Different energy levels. The energy levels available to the electrons are different for every different element. Since the energy levels are different, so are the wavelengths of the spectral lines that the elements like to emit really so different elements have different spectral lines as a result. Yes? I have a question about the spectral lines. Yeah. Um, okay. So does anybody want to follow up with anything about the Balmer series? Yeah? Okay. okay. Yes? Uh-huh. The, the graph that you showed us um, later on with the with these lines missing, would that be from yeah, uh -huh. so um, if you have a cool cloud of hydrogen that is sitting in front of a source of white light, then it will produce those four spectral lines as absorption lines. So you have the rainbow colors, but this red color would be missing. In other words, there would be a black line at the location where this red line is here in emission. And there'd be a black line in the rainbow where that cyan colored, turquoise colored line is. And there'd be black lines for the other ones as well. And in a star, instead of it being a cool cloud of hydrogen gas in front of a light bulb or something like that, in a star what we've got is, what's serving as the light bulb is the deeper, hotter layers of the star. And what's serving as the cool cloud of gas is the outer layers of the star because they're cooler than the deeper layers. Stars get cooler as you move towards the surface. And so the outer layers serve as the cool gas in front of the hot, dense source of white light, continuum light, from deeper down in the star. So that's why we're seeing the absorption lines in the star spectrum. Yes? Is that a follow Are we going to have a follow up on that? Or Yeah, OK. Why are the wavelengths for the spectral lines of emission and absorption lines different? the same? Because the energy levels involved are exactly the same. So in other words, if an electron jumps, if an electron absorbs a photon to go from n equals 2 to n equals 3, the energy of that photon is at 12.1 electron volts minus 10.2 electron volts just the difference in those two energy levels. So, it'll, so in other words, hydrogen can absorb photons with an energy of 1.9 electron volts and go from the electron being in the n equals 2 orbit to being in the n equals 3 orbit. But if you've got an electron in the n equals 3 orbit, 
it can jump down to the n equals 2 orbit and give off a photon. What will the energy of that photon be? The same thing, 12.1 electron volts minus 10.2 electron volts. So in other words, the absorption lines and emission lines have the same wavelengths because the only difference between them is, is the electron jumping up or is the electron jumping down? The amount of energy involved is the same because it's the same levels that it can jump up and down between. That's the idea. I have no idea who might have raised their hand at this point. Yes, okay. Can I change the question? No. I mean, yes. Uh -huh. Can you do it like um, the, an example problem for like getting the angular resolution? Um, I could, but I don't want to because I'll just tell you I don't, have a, I don't have a quantitative question about that on the exam. Yes. But what I would want you to understand is the way that it works is that if, so, so if we write down what the formula is, it involves the wavelength divided by the diameter it, times some constant is the angular resolution. So uh, answer the following question. If I have two telescopes and one has a large diameter and the other has a small diameter, which one has better angular resolution, the large diameter one or the small diameter one? The large diameter one does. Does that mean the number for the angular resolution, how many arc seconds it can distinguish two sources of light? Will that be bigger or smaller? Put another way, is, is, is it better to have a large number for the angular re re resolution or a small number for the angular resolution? Smaller is better because the angular resolution is the angle, the smallest angle between two point sources where you can still cut them apart. Well, the smaller that angle is, the sharper the images you can form, the more fine detail that you can see. So angular resolution is like golf, right? In other words, lower scores are better in golf, and similarly, lower scores are better in angular resolution. You want the smallest value for the angular resolution you can get. So a bigger telescope gives you better angular resolution. How about wavelength-wise? If I have two telescopes, they're exactly the same size, but one is a radio telescope and the other is an optical telescope. Which one has better angular resolution, the optical visible light telescope or the radio telescope? The optical telescope does because why? No, that's not it. How does the wavelength factor in here? Do shorter wavelengths or longer wavelengths lead to smaller angular and therefore better <laughs> angular resolution? Shorter wavelengths are better for angular resolution. So the optical telescope wins that battle because it's dealing with short wavelengths, visible light wavelengths, versus long wavelengths, like radio telescopes have to work on. Which is why even a gigantic radio telescope working on its own doesn't have very good angular resolution because it's dealing with radio waves and you just can't focus long wavelengths like that very sharply is what it comes down to because of interference effects. Yes? So is that why they um, always put radio telescopes together? We don't always do that, but we often do that. The only way to get sharp images, really sharp images with radio telescopes is to hook them together because it turns out that you can combine their signals and get an angular resolution which is equivalent to having a single giant radio telescope whose diameter is equal to the distance between the dishes that you put together. And so with that interferometry, we can get very sharp images with radio telescopes. Uh, but that requires that specialized technique. Is what it comes down. We're starting to be able to do that with optical telescopes and that now produce some really spectacular results, but that's still in its infancy because it's harder to do that with short wavelength uh, light waves than it is with radio waves. Especially since I 